Good morning. It is Wednesday, September the 8th, 2021. Welcome to another edition of the National Newspaper Publishers Association and Black Press of America's Let It Be Known. Children now represent 26.8% of the weekly COVID-19 cases, climbing COVID-19 cases, and particularly the increasing proportion re reported in children are causing many health experts to worry about the outbreak as the school year gets underway across the entire country. Schools, particularly in the South, started their new year in August in many districts, notably those without mass measures in place, saw an explosion of cases. And doctors and experts warned it could happen again when students in much of the rest of the country return to school this week, unless there is a strong action to keep the virus in check. This morning, we talk with Dr. James Hildreth, the president of Meharry Medical College and who, who's also on the board of the FDA. But first, of course, let us bring on our president and CEO, Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis Jr. Good morning, Dr. Chavis. Good morning, Stacey Brown. And we welcome all of our brothers and sisters and all of our viewers from across the nation uh, to let it be known. And on behalf of Karen Carter Richards, our chair of the NMPA, uh, 230 African-American owned newspapers and media companies. Uh, we're very pleased uh, to be with you. And those headlines about children, uh, you know, the majority of black people still live in the South. And those are the states where there's record number of uh, increases now in COVID-19 uh, cases, infections, and uh, so many children. And so we uh, hope that all of our parents and all of our leaders in our communities uh, will take all the necessary precautions to protect uh, Black America from uh, this virus that disproportionately uh, is affecting our children, disproportionately affecting our families, uh, dif disproportionately um, uh, in the fatalities uh, as around COVID-19. And still too much hesitation uh, in Black America when it comes to getting the truth and that's, that's why we have an obligation in the black press to make sure that we keep our people informed about this deadly disease. I'm glad that Dr. Hildreth is gonna be with us uh, this morning because he's uh, one of the top uh, infectious disease uh, authorities uh, in America. And we're pleased that we have a brother who's not only the president of Meharry Medical College, uh, but also on the FDA panel. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the Black Press of America has learned, Dr. Chavis, that President Biden will address uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic as it relates to children in schools. Uh, later today, uh, a White House official telling the Black Press uh, this morning that look out for the president uh, address. They're giving us a little bit of a heads up that he is going to tackle that today in an address to the nation. So uh, we'll be watching for that. Also, Dr. Chavis in the news, Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott on Tuesday signed into law a bill that bans 24-hour and drive-through voting, imposing new hurdles on a mail-in uh, on mail-in ballots and empowers partisan poll watchers. The restrictive voting measure adds Texas to the list of Republican-controlled states that have seized on former President Donald Trump's lies about widespread voter uh, fraud and clamp down on access to the ballot box this year. Already, Florida, Georgia, and other states have enacted new voting laws. The election overhaul in Texas comes as Republicans seek to hold on to power in a rapidly changing state where people of color make up virtually all of the population growth. And that growth is concentrated in large cities that tend to vote Democratic. So one to watch there, um, Dr. Chavis, we've been talking about this for a while, and now it is law in Texas, these new voter, they call them suppression, we call them oppression laws. Uh, absolutely, oppression, suppression, uh, systemic racism, they all converge on legislation at the state level, like what Texas just did. Uh, the governor of Texas is uh, obstructing justice, the state legislature in Texas, they are obstructing justice and they're doing it in a racially motivated manner. Uh, Texas had a very high voter turnout in the 2020 elections, particularly among communities of color. And that's why they passed these laws. So in all these voter suppression laws, they're really uh, racism uh, in, uh, implementing laws. 
uh, to, uh, they fear uh, uh, the black vote, they fear the Latino vote, they fear communities of color voting. So we have to uh, make sure that we don't let these laws uh, stand. Uh, they've already been challenged, but while the laws have been challenged, we have to make sure that we redouble our efforts to get everyone who's eligible or uh, registered to vote and get everybody prepared to go uh, vote. In other words, uh, I've always said the way you handle voter suppression is uh, maximum voter turnout in spite of the suppression, in spite of these tactics, we have to get out every single vote in our communities, across, not just in Texas, but in all 50 states. Yeah, and Dr. Chambers, before we move on with the headlines, I want to say a very special good morning to a, a really good friend of ours who's watching this morning, Dr. Chambers, the one and only Rocky Bucano from the Universal Hip Hop Museum. Good morning, Rocky. Thank you so much for tuning in. Yes, we, we, we thank Brother Rocky and all of the members of the um, you know, Universal Hip Hop Museum uh, in the Bronx. Uh, it's going to be a national treasure. Uh, we, we really um, salute Rocky and the leadership there and uh, want them to know that the Black press will support uh, the Universal Hip Hop Museum um, 100%. Yeah, and I, you know, Rocky, uh, you're listening. I was just with Carmen Ashurst uh, last week and we talked a little bit more about the museum and she, like you and everyone else, is really, really excited. And Dr. Chavis, in the news, um, the PNC Foundation has committed more than $1 billion to help end systemic racism and support economic empowerment of African-Americans in low and moderate income communities. The Baltimore Times is reporting that part of that commitment is $300,000 to the Center for Urban Families in Baltimore and $300,000 to Coppin State University over a three-year period. As a Main Street Bank, as a Main Street Bank, PNC is dedicated to enriching the lives of people we meet every day and to create a more inclusive economy, said Laura Gamble, who is the PNC's regional president for Greater Maryland. She says PNC has a history of investing in our communities and the people who live in these communities to help them become self-sufficient. Now, through these two initiatives, we are also going to make a positive impact through employee volunteerism. So good story there coming out of the from the Baltimore Times, our member paper there, and the Annapolis Times as well, Dr. Chavis. Absolutely. And we hope other banks will follow uh, PNC Bank's uh, lead. Um, there needs to be reinvestment. You know, there's this Community Reinvestment Act. There's still a law where all banks, our mainstream banks, uh, community banks, uh, whatever type of financial services, they're obligated uh, to get a federal uh, charter to be a bank uh, to reinvest in the communities. And that has been really lacking. So we want to uh, uh, thank PNC uh, for what they're doing in Baltimore, but call on other banks to do it in every city across the country. Yeah. And also uh, this morning, Langston Frazier, he was born hearing impaired in both ears, which nullified any chance of participating in sports like basketball or football. But in an inspiring story originating from the PGA.com website, Frazier found golf in the fourth grade in Bowie, Maryland, through an initiative called First Tee. The program enables children to build the strength of character to face a lifetime of new challenges. As noted, uh, the First Tee, uh, by the First Tee website, by seamlessly integrating the game of golf with life skills curriculum, we create learning experiences that build inner strength self-confidence and resilience that kids carry to everything they do. Uh, so Langston uh, says he figured if I can play golf and I can be a teacher at the same time, why not? He's 24 years old, Dr. Chavis, and he says that he enrolled in the PGA Golf Management University program at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is all an HBCU, as you know. He yes. enrolled in June after hundreds of classroom hours and thousands of on-course hours he became the newest of about 200 African-American PGA members. The golfing uh, industry said Frazier already had put his PGA education to use as an assistant golf professional at the University of Maryland golf course, the, the same school where he's pursuing a graduate degree in broadcast journalism. So Langston Frazier is doing it all. He says he writes on his LinkedIn page that this membership is much more than an ID number, membership card, or a lapel 
pen and it's not just a fancy piece of paper. It shows people, especially little kids that look like me, kids of color, that, hey, if he can do it, I can do it too. The PGA of America, which recently entered into a strategic alliance with the National Newspaper Publishers Association, said it's making efforts on several fronts to increase African-American membership. So great story there. Uh, we're going to watch uh, the uh, career path of Langston Frazier. Absolutely. And again, uh, we salute Jay uh, Monahan, uh, the commissioner of the PGA Tour. Uh, and um, we have strengthened the relationship between the NMPA and the PGA Tour. And this is a great example of working with one of our historically black colleges and universities. Uh, University of uh, uh, Eastern Shore in Maryland um, to provide a program. They also have scholarships now for, for golf. And I think that a number of other HBCUs are uh, going to do the same thing as we increase um, African-American participation in this professional sport. But I would also say uh, over the um, Labor Day weekend, Stacey, I actually went out into the golf course for the first you time. Both. <laughs> I did. Uh, uh, you know, learning how to swing, learning how to putt, learning the fundamentals of, of golf, because, uh, you know, we have to practice what we preach. We're encouraging others to do it, so we have to learn it ourselves. Well, I, I saw you out there. I, I got some some uh, black male pictures, Dr. Chavis, so uh, we'll we'll talk Rays at a later time. <laughs> All right. Very good. Okay. <laughs> But and remember this too that it's we have a relationship with both the PGA Tour and the PGA of America, and what Langston um, Frazier is doing is in conjunction with the PGA of America. Uh, but both organizations, as you said, the commissioner has been outstanding and forthright, and and what his desires are, and they are practicing what they preach, and certainly the NNPA uh, practices what it preaches. Dr. Chavis, we know that the the virus. It's continuing to, to spread, to, to um, get out of control, if you will, with the Delta variant and the new Mu variant and other variants. Well, kids are back to school, and we talk to Dr. James E.K. Hildreth, the president of Meharry Medical College, about this situation. Let's take a look at what Dr. Hildreth had to say. With so much uncertainty, so much chaos and so much controversy surrounding whether or not folks should get vaccinated and certainly with the new variants, the Delta variant, and now the World Health Organization has mentioned the MU or MU variant as a variant of interest. It is so important to bring in an expert and there's no uh, better expert than Dr. James Hildreth from Meharry Medical College. Dr. Hildreth, thank you so much for joining us. It's always my pleasure to be with you and thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, and Dr. Hildreth, well, let's just get right into it. Let's first talk about the, the World Health Organization just talk, just um, released the MU or MU variant uh, as a variant of interest. Can you tell us a little bit about that and should we be concerned about it? We Yes, we should certainly be concerned. Uh, there are three levels of variants that the WHO recognizes. There's variants of interest, variants of concern, and then there's variants of, of high consequence. And the variants of interest means that they have some changes that might affect the way the virus binds to our cells or the way that antibodies binds to the virus. But we're not as concerned about those because they don't appear to have a change in transmissibility or infectivity. The variants of concern, however, like Delta, do have higher transmissibility. And as you probably have seen, Delta seems to make people sicker quicker. So uh, any of the variants that rise to the level of interest, we should pay attention to them because all of the variants of concern, they started out as variants of interest. So oh. clearly this one needs to, we need to keep our eye on it uh, as it moves forward. And Dr. Hildreth, hospitalizations are up um, deaths are going up again, unfortunately. Okay, what's the message? We know the message is, 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 to, is, to, is to be, be safe, to wear masks, to, to get the vaccines if you can. Um, but many, we, we keep hearing, Dr. Hildreth, uh, many say that they, don't, they still don't trust the vaccine or that they don't want to do it. They have a, the, the right not to do it. 
as one of the foremost experts on this, Dr. Hildreth, you are actually on the FDA board that approved the vaccine. Right. Can you talk about the importance of the vaccine and, and respond to people who say they just don't trust it? I mean, first, I acknowledge that ordinary people who are not into medicine or science might have legitimate questions about the vaccine. We have to accept that, and that's reasonable. But I think when all the questions have been answered and you think about the, the risk of getting COVID-19, getting really sick and dying, which is a real risk. I mean, this is, this is a pandemic virus, which means that it makes people very ill and kills people if it has the chance to. And my, one of my main concerns is that we as a people, as African-Americans, we have such a higher burden of heart disease, hypertension, asthma, obesity, that that makes us at greater risk than, than, than white people are because they have much lower incidence of those things. So we, as a people, need to be especially vigilant about this, uh, the, about COVID-19, given that we have this high burden of disease and death. So, but I've been studying viruses for 40 years, starting as a sophomore in college. I've done research on viruses for, I don't know, 30 plus years. And, uh, you know, I've also studied the immune system. That's where my specialty is, is knowing the immune system, how it works. And I can tell people that none of the steps required to evaluate the safety of the vaccines were omitted. They were developed quickly, that is true, and that could raise some concerns, but even that can be answered. And if, if I may, let me just say three things that give you, should give you comfort as to why the vaccines could be produced in less than a year. The first is technology. We have technologies available to us that have not been available uh, up to this time, and they accelerated the process of, dis of discovery very dramatically. The second thing is vaccine development is normally an iterative process. What I mean by that is you do one step, you follow that by another step, and you follow that by another step. The resources were made available to the drug companies to do these steps in parallel. So now instead of having a six month process followed by another six month process, those were run in parallel. You have to make some assumptions about the out, uh, what the outcomes are gonna be, but parallel processes compress the time frame. And the last thing is, which I know a lot about is, we've been trying to make an HIV vaccine for 37 years. We don't have an HIV vaccine, but what we do have is an incredible infrastructure for vaccine development that in February of 2020, the HIV work was put on hold and the HIV vaccine network became the COVID-19 vaccine network. What I mean is that scientists, facilities, protocols, technologies that were focused on HIV for the last three decades, all of that was brought to bear in COVID-19. So technology, parallel processes, and an existing infrastructure allowed us to create vaccines in a record, record time. So even though it seems incredible, almost miraculous to have vaccines develop so quickly. It's not a miracle. There's nothing magical about it. It's just a lot of hard work over decades that let us do this. Yeah, again, we're talking with Dr. James E.K. Hildreth, the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College and one of the foremost uh, experts in this uh, conversation that we're, we're having today. Uh, Dr. Hildreth, uh, can you speak to us about the increasing trend of people consuming if I can pronounce this correctly, ivermectin as a substitute, yeah, for getting vaccinated. Uh, it's really not a wise thing to do. Ivermectin is a, a drug used to treat parasitic infections in animals, primarily horses, and it was never meant to be used in humans. There are no studies I'm aware of of ivermectin in humans compared to the vaccines which have been evaluated in hundreds of thousands of people, and it's gone through this rigorous scientific evaluation. We don't know what ivermectin will do to humans long-term, but it's really not a wise idea. Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that this uh, compound, this drug will be effective against COVID-19. And I realize that there's a certain level of desperation, but the desperation should lead people to get the information they need about vaccines and get vaccinated. That's the much, more safer course to deal with COVID-19 than taking a drug that was meant to treat parasites in horses. It's just not a wise thing to do.
Yeah, and, and I keep hearing too, and we, we heard this before, and now we're hearing it again, it seems. Um, people say, well, I've already had the virus. I can't, I can't, can't get it again. Um, I don't need to be um, vaccinated. I have antibodies. Please respond to that. Well, unfortunately, that's not correct. People who have COVID-19 and recover, they can be reinfected. And that happens a great number of times. And what is kind of disturbing to me is that some individuals who had COVID-19 the first time and had a mild disease, the second time they get it, they end up in the hospital, some of them on ventilators. What that really means is that the immune protection you get from having COVID-19 is unnecessarily protective, at least not protective for the long term. And now we have published data, research to show that if you recover from COVID-19 and you get one shot of a mRNA vaccine, for example, your coverage against COVID-19 is, is as good or stronger than someone who got two shots of the vaccine. So we strongly recommend that everyone who had COVID-19 and recovered, they get vaccinated anyway, just to make sure they have full protection. Yeah, and, and being vaccinated, uh, it, it protects you in many ways, right? Um, you could be exposed to the virus, but I understand just listen to the CDC and others that you don't necessarily get as ill as you would if you hadn't had the vaccine. That's exactly right. So the vaccines don't create a, a shield around you to make you impervious to the virus. What it does is get your immune system ready that as soon as the virus gets into your system, there's a quick response to shut it down. That's why the symptoms are limited. That's why the disease is limited because your immune system cuts the virus off before it has a chance to really get going. And let me also say that some of the, the infections that people are reporting as breakthrough infections may not be breakthrough infections. They may just be that a person got exposed to the virus and the COVID-19 test is so sensitive that even dead virus, even residual virus materials can turn up as a positive. So I think the rate of, of breakthrough infections may not be quite as much as people perceive it to be just because this test is so sensitive. Well, that's it. That's some interesting. And, and I say good news, too, um, to hear hear that. Dr. Dr. Hildreth, schools are now reopened in m most places around the country. Uh, now, I'll preface this to say I'm a parent. Uh, I have a 14 year old who's vaccinated. But of mm -hmm. course, I have an 11 year old who's not yet vaccinated. Um, we've elected to homeschool until she can get vaccinated. But given the range of opinions, policies and practices in place, is it a good idea for parents to send their children to school? Uh, I think the short answer is, for most places, in my opinion, is not safe because uh, mask mandates are not in place. And here in Tennessee, for example, we have a mask mandate, but the governor has given parents the option to opt out of this. They can send their kid to school without a mask. So a mandate with exceptions is not a mandate, it's just a recommendation. The recommendations won't stop this virus. The, the, the point of the matter is, we are now seeing infection rates among children that are much higher than they've ever been. For example, for most of the pandemic, children accounted for about 14% of all the cases. That has crept up to about 24%. One in four cases are now in children. And even though children, might do well with COVID-19. We know that children can get long COVID, this syndrome you have after you get over the virus. And since children are not small adults, their systems are still developing, the nervous system, circulatory system, skeletal systems, they're all still being developed. In fact, the skeletal system is not fully developed, for example, until we're in our early 20s. My point is, we don't know that long COVID, which affects the brain, respiratory system and other systems in our body, will that have any impact long-term in a child whose systems are still being developed, okay? So I believe not knowing the impact of long COVID on children, even if they have a mild case of COVID-19, we should do everything we can to keep COVID-19 out of our children, especially black and brown children who happen to have higher rates of underlying conditions that make them more susceptible to severe COVID and severe and to, and to dying. In fact, 
according to the CDC data, most of the children who died of COVID-19 happen to be black and brown. Mm -hmm. So we as a community need to do everything we can to create a shield around our children who are not vaccinated. We do that in two ways. We make sure that the people around our children are masked and vaccinated. That should, that should be what we demand of our leaders. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have leaders, we have politicians. There's the difference. Exactly. And we, if we, <laughs> but I'm gonna leave that alone. But, but, <laughs> but what we need is, again, we need to do everything we can to protect our children. And the way we do that, Stacey, is we had to make sure that the people around them are vaccinated and they're wearing masks. Yeah, yeah. So, so this this rush to get the kids back in school, especially the unvaccinated ones, is really a problem. Well, and you know that school systems all over the country are now shutting down, if even, even if only temporarily, because of the outbreaks that we're seeing. Yeah, it's really, and, it's really a, a challenging situation. Yeah, and and before we let you go, Dr. Hildreth, again, we really appreciate your time. Can you explain? Uh, the rationale and effectiveness of booster shots for those that have already been vaccinated. So Stacy, the, the, the rationale is that we have, we've been collecting data on vaccine recipients and their antibody levels really since the phase one trials, there's been data collected. And what the data is showing is that over time, the antibody levels that have been induced by the vaccine, they start to taper off somewhere after about seven or eight months, the, the levels seem to go down. So what, this, what the FDA is going to do, and I'm on the panel that will make this review, on September the 17th, the same committee that reviewed the vaccines for approval is going to meet and review the data to make a recommendation about whether or not boosters are necessary. Let me just say that, and I want to frighten people, that even though the antibody levels are dropping, they're still high enough, at least in the laboratory, to neutralize the virus, which gives me comfort that there doesn't need to be a mad rush to get boosters, but we do want to be proactive and make sure the levels don't drop below the critical threshold needed to protect people. But that's what that's what the conversation will be on the 17th at the FDA. Well, Dr. James Hildreth, the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College, and one we certainly uh, hold up in the black press as the foremost expert and all of all things to do with the COVID vaccine and COVID itself. We really appreciate you, your staff, uh, and, and all those, uh, Hope Buckner and those FM partners as well. So thank you, Dr. Hildreth, for, for joining us uh, today. And thank you, Stacy. And again, thank you to the Black Press for keeping our communities informed and protected. It's much needed and much appreciated. Now, all the best to you, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. Dr. Chavis, um, let's try and unpack a little bit. There's, uh, yes. I think, a lot of news there um, from Dr. Hildreth. I, I start with uh, the fact that, again, vaccination. I mean, he, he highlighted, I thought, um, vaccination is so important. Uh, there's the anti-vaxxers. But look, you know, you talk about you want your freedom. Well, doesn't that mean living? And if you want to keep living, <laughs> you should get vaccinated, right? Exactly. And um, one of the headlines of news that was just uh, uh, put out by Dr. James Hildreth uh, was that he went on the record to say that the children, the majority of the children that are dying right now across America from COVID-19 are uh, black and brown children. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say that again. Black and brown children are dying more than any other children right now from COVID-19. And we thank Dr. James Hill for telling the black press that truth. And we have a responsibility uh, in the black press uh, to keep our people informed and to warn our people. You know, we were the first to declare a state of emergency in black and brown communities last year. And now we have to uh, uh, declare a state of emergency for our children because our children are dying according to Dr. James Hilton, more than any other children, black and brown children are dying. That's the headline. And and also, you know, he kind of broke with what you, you've heard from other experts on this, right, about schools. He's not a proponent of schools opening right now. You, you saw that in his comments. Uh, you, you see that in, in his body language and, and how frustrated he appeared that this virus, and Dr. Chavis, come on, 
anybody who sees these children that we've seen on 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 um, ventilators, gasping for air, you know, trying to hold these little kids, it's a problem. And as he stated, you know, um, folks are being guided by by politics and politicians who are, as he says, his words, not leaders. They're politicians. That's right, and we cannot allow people to play uh, politics with the health and welfare, um, uh, you know, the public safety of, of our children and our communities. Uh, we do need leaders. And this is not to indict all politicians. That's not right. the issue. The issue is uh, we have to believe in science. You know, we still have, uh, with all the devastating uh, thing that just happened from the hurricane in the South and in the Northeast, you still have people who are denying science. They, they deny uh, uh, climate change. And unfortunately, uh, in the uh, black and brown communities, there's so many myths and untruths that spread, particularly on social media, uh, giving people an excuse uh, not to uh, be vaccinated, not to wear a mask, not to wait or wash your hands, and to push our children out into an unsafe situation. So that's why the black press is so uh, uh, not only valuable, but critically important every day we have to get the news out about how dangerous, how deadly uh, this virus is, particularly now for our children. Yeah, and we are going just a little longer uh, this morning. It's such an important topic. And um, listen, Rocky Bocano, um, Dr. Chavis, he talks about um, the importance. He says this is such an important topic. We have to find a better way to stress the importance of getting vaccinated. Far too many of our people are putting their lives and the lives of others at risk uh, by not uh, being vaccinated. And that's the, the message we continue. The black press, the NMPA continues to, to push out the importance of these vaccines. Uh, absolutely. And Brother Rock is right. Uh, we have to be uh, consistent. And uh, there's no greater message uh, that we can get to our people uh, than to warn them of the dangers and warn them also about the benefits. You know, you do have a choice in this matter. You don't have to allow COVID-19 to overtake your family, overtake your children. And uh, there's too many funerals uh, because of uh, our uh, community and people. Uh, research has also shown that uh, overwhelming, I think it's 90 some percent of the people who are dying are unvaccinated. Unvaccinated, yes, indeed. And, and Dr. Chavis, um, Dr. Hildreth also mentioned when we talked about the, the children, he said, you know, we don't fully develop um, until you're 20 years old, he says, right? But he talks about long COVID and these kids, they don't have adult bodies is what he was saying. And so you're really putting them at risk. You got to protect them. Exactly, exactly. And not allowing your, your children to go into an unsafe environment. And a lot of these states, particularly in the South, again, uh, these governors are preventing uh, uh, the governor of Florida is in, even uh, uh, finding and uh, threatening uh, school districts who do have a mass mandate. So this just shows you that, that the politics is wrong. Uh, that's what's wrong with uh, uh, systemic racism. You know, we have um, uh, the politicization of racism in America. Yeah, a absolutely. And you know, we we have to, I can't stress it enough, we have to protect our most vulnerable, the children, the seniors. In fact, Dr. Chavis, um, the CDC and, and um, the uh, Johns Hopkins recently put out uh, a study that showed that most seniors over the age of 65, about 94% are vaccinated. So, uh, so the seniors are taking the lead here the younger ones under 12 cannot get vaccinated, but those between the ages of 18 and 40, Dr. Chavis, the numbers are so low. Um, it's something in the neighborhood of 35% of a vaccine rate between those 18 and 40. So the younger ones, Dr. Chavis, are not getting vaccinated. Those who are eligible to get vaccinated, they are still not getting vaccinated. Right, that's because that age category uh, they have, so that's where all the misinformation is going, you know, and, and I think that, again, uh, for our Generation Z, our millennials, uh, and if you're over uh, 12, if you're over 14 years old, uh, you need to be getting uh, vaccinated. 
Yeah. And Dr. Ebony Hilton, who we will have on this program uh, next week, um, she talked about the, the change in the percentages of the population suffering from COVID um, as more blacks get vaccinated and whites resist vaccination. So so you, you see what's going on here. It, oh, absolutely. It's, it's racially motivated. That's why I'm trying to say that uh, systemic racism is in the healthcare system. Uh, systemic racism at these state legislatures. They're not only suppressing black voters and, and brown voters, they're also suppressing black health and, and the health of brown communities. These things are related. Yeah. You know, uh, r racism, uh, a racist is not going to say, well, you know, I'm going to uh, take advantage of these people just in one category of life. No. But the very yeah. definition of systemic racism is that it is in every category of life. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. And Dr. Chavis, finally, too, um, we could add this coming weekend, the start of the, the National Football League season, stadiums will be filled again. Uh, we see, um, again, uh, thanks to Rocky sending in this information, the University of Georgia is not requiring masks or proof of vaccination for their football games. This is college football he's obviously talking about. But and he says it is the highest level of irresponsibility. He couldn't agree more. And it's going to be interesting to see what the NFL does about uh, mask and mask mandates. We know that Major League Baseball has not uh, instituted a, a mask uh, mandate. I'm not sure what the NBA is going to do uh, this coming season about masks. But it's going to be interesting because we just had a holiday weekend in which already the CDC has shown a spike in cases uh, from the holiday weekend, people partying, they're without masks, uh, they're gathering. It, it's really, really irresponsible, as Rocky says. Oh, absolutely. And again, we're going to continue to be on this case. And uh, I know some people will say, well, wow, they just talk about this virus <laughs> all the time. That's our responsibility. And we're going to continue. You know, we, we're not a, a news organization uh, that chooses to uh, defer or chooses to uh, hesitate. You know, we, we're not, black, black, I'm so proud of the black press. Uh, we're not uh, hesitant. For 194 years, the black press has not hesitated in pleading our own cause and putting our own information out there about the truth. And then we're gonna continue to do that no matter uh, how many people uh, sometimes may take exception uh, to what the black press does. This is our responsibility. That's why we exist and we will continue to perform our mission accordingly. Yeah, and as as our news director and producer Norman Rich says, if we can save one life by providing our viewers with access to information and experts, it's all worth it. And we couldn't agree more. We certainly couldn't agree more. And don't forget to check out the NNPA and the Black Press of America on TikTok at NNPA Black Press and make plans now to join us for the NNPA's National Leadership Awards reception, September 16th. And you see the flyer there. Um, those are being honored. Uh, Senator Cori Bush, Congresswoman, Co uh, uh, Senator Cori Bush, Congresswoman Cori Bush, Senator Cori Booker, uh, Reverend Senator Warnock, Raphael Warnock, Dr. James Hildreth, who you just heard from this morning, Dr. Ebony Hilton, and Olympic champion, record setter, Allison Felix. Dr. Chavis, I know you are looking forward to that. Oh, absolutely. It's going to be virtual so everybody can attend and uh, participate and get the vital information that will be shared at the virtual NMPA 2021 National Leadership Awards reception, September the 16th. Yeah, and you can register, as Dr. Chavis said, it's free at virtualnmpa2021.com, www.virtual nnpa2021.com. Let it be known. Remember this. The story of your life has many chapters. One bad chapter doesn't mean it's the end of the book. Have a great day. Stay safe. Get vaccinated if you can, and we'll see you tomorrow.